Uh, guests and speakers, uh, Nina Galantia, who is the principal or head of uh, the foundation, Shemechka Foundation, that stands behind the beauty festival that starts just today and will continue until next weekend. Uh, and then uh, Nazia Said, uh, who is a journalist from Bahrain, now living in Paris. And our third guest, the surprise, uh, Karim, who is sitting here, and I almost was him here among the students. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give them a push. Thank you, Katka. Thank you for inviting us actually for this uh, great event. Um, great, so 45 minutes, a little less right now. Well, uh, so I'm Mia. Uh, thank you for being here in like such people, uh, this is crazy, I never expected this many people and many students being here. Uh, thank you Nazia for, for uh, really accepting the invitation and carrying it with us. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard about Fusion Festival, but uh, we have uh, already the 13th year of Fusion Festival. Um, and uh, it takes place uh, in Bratislava mostly for uh, one week, starting today officially. Uh, we will actually officially um, uh, start in the evening with the discussion with Nazia. So if you still have questions or uh, have not enough, uh, then come to the English as well um, today. We have uh, more than 40 events uh, during this week, uh, including the weekends. So if you want to, then there will be programs downstairs. Uh, which you can just scroll, well, look at, have a look at, uh, and choose something which, uh, what you like. It's concerts, discussions, uh, theater, uh, community activities. Uh, we will be at the Dobrik, uh, Dobrik, so Good Market tomorrow. Uh, just come and have a look. If you want to have a long read and you don't, uh, you don't. Uh, um, well, you don't come to the to festival, then you just grab this uh, our magazine uh, this year. Um, it deals with different topics, and uh, as this year's topic is trust, so go uh, This is all about trust from different perspectives. And don't worry, uh, I'm adding. <laughs> so, well, uh, fusion is about migration. It's about uh, um, attitudes towards migrants, towards foreigners, really good among us. Uh, and Nazia is going to talk about her story. Uh, she's uh, right now a persecuted um, uh, journalist living in France um, and about the freedom of speech. If you have questions, I'm sure she will love to answer them. So, Nazia. This amount of students uh, from Slovakia or from Bratislava. And uh, thank you for inviting me for this event to talk to you. Uh, I would like to, first of all, to um, uh, send like peace to, to the soul of uh, uh, Jan, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, the journalist who was killed six weeks ago here in Slovakia. We would like to, to mention him, of course, because, because, because of these people, we, we can have better life because he is a person that was uh, trying to to uh, shed light and to uh, write about corruption in the country, and that's why he lost his life. These people who are making our lives better, and they lose their lives to for, for that purpose. Um, I'm a Bahraini journalist, as uh, as uh, Nina mentioned, and. Uh, I'm practicing journalism since more than 18 years. I'm more spe specialized in politics and human rights, uh, all kinds of uh, things related to human rights. And uh, you don't know much about my country. It's a small island, it's a small Arabic island uh, uh, in the Gulf, Arabic Gulf. And uh, in 2011, maybe you heard about uh, protests that been broke uh, out uh, in uh, Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, in Yemen, calling for more democracies, and my country was one of these countries. 
where people went on the street calling for more democracy and more freedoms. And unfortunately, the crackdown on the, on the protesters were very harsh. The, the army were on the streets and they, they were arresting people and killing protesters and, and taking people to jail and uh, getting uh, tortured and uh, uh, punished for just going out on the street and calling for democracy and more freedoms. And uh, none of, of people who were on the street, even somebody like me, who were there to cover what was going on, because this is my job as a journalist, uh, we were also punished. So I was arrested in 2011, and uh, uh, during the arrest I was uh, tortured. And when I w went out, I, like, it, it, it changed, this, uh, this event uh, changed my life. And when I went out, I became an advocate for freedom of press and freedom of expression. And uh, since then, I'm, uh, I'm advocating for that. I'm uh, talking about my colleagues who are in prison. We have around 14 journalists and photographers behind bars now, while we are talking here in Bahrain. Uh, they are sentenced uh, five years, ten years for life in uh, and, and prison just for being journalists or for posting information over online or, or uh, trying to make the world know about what's going on in Bahrain and the violations of human rights and talking about the kind of dictatorship that we have. Um, as I said, since uh, 2011 I became an advocate for, uh, for uh, 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 freedom of press and freedom of expression and that put me under pressure of the government. They, they are like, I'm, they look at me as an enemy and they don't like that I'm doing this. So in 2016, I was uh, banned from working as a journalist. They didn't allow me to continue doing my job. And I was prosecuted for that as well. I was taken to, to court because um, I was doing my job. And uh, I was banned from travel for a certain time. And when I could travel, I left the country because I felt like this is going to go further and further and I might end up in prison. So I chose to, to, to go to Paris, to France, because I work with French media for tw more than 12 years. So I decided to go to France to, to continue my work from there. And this is what happened. So I am living in France for more than a year and a half. And uh, I'm working from there as a journalist, still covering some Bahraini issues, some issues from the Gulf, and also um, some stories from Paris where I live. Um, I think that's, that's what I have. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk long. I, I, I would like to give the floor to you to, if you have any questions, if you um, um, want to know more about Bahrain, about politics, about uh, journalists, about freedom of expression, I'm more than happy to answer your questions. One last thing I would like to say that um, you live in, in a country, in an EU country, and uh, you have a democracy, not like the South world, let's say. I know that your democracy is also struggling and it's also uh, like under questioning, but still, like where, where are you is is much better than where the other countries are, such as mine. So I would, I, I think you should appreciate what you have and work to make it better. Be, like, because because this is where we should take our countries. Not like we just don't take it for granted. Oh, we have these freedoms. We can speak in media, and that's it. No, we should protect it and call for it more. And this is the time to do that. It's since since um, uh, the the whole public uh, uh, opinion now are toward more freedom of uh, press and toward more uh, anti-corruption, then it's time to to work for that. And you are the young generation who can take this country to better to better uh, to, to develop it and to make it better for you and for the next generation.
think this is a question time, and the first question would be for me. Um, well, I was listening to radio today in the morning, uh, and I heard that in past 10 years, several journalists were killed in the European Union. So, uh, do you think that the situation of journalists is getting worse, or is it improving? Why? What's the cause of all this? It's, it's different from a, from a place to another, but journalists are always under risk because they are the ones who are revealing facts, they are the ones who are revealing corruption, and they are uh, criticizing governments and criticizing people who are in power. So these people in power, they, they have the power to prosecute them, to put them in a prison, to torture them, to kill them. Even like the militants in some in some countries, the people in power are militants. They are not the government, for example. And these are the ones who are violating uh, journalists' rights and and journalists and and threatening journalists' lives. I I can't say that it's getting better or worse, but I think that there is places where, as you said, in in EU there is several uh, uh, journalists uh, were killed in the past ten years. But in comparison to how much journalists were killed in Russia, for example, at the same time, it will be 10 times more, maybe. So the situation better in certain countries than, than other countries, that doesn't mean, as I said earlier, that we just accept it the way it is, but we work to improve it. And EU yesterday were trying to pass uh, uh, declaration or something to protect journalists, to make the countries working more on protecting journalists, which is, if it happened, it would be a, a good thing. And I hope that it happened in all countries all around the world, not only in the EU, but EU may be a first step and we can take it further because, you know, the South world is looking at EU, oh, they are the most uh, developed, so if they do that, then maybe we can, we can do it as well. And don't smoke. You hear her coughing. <laughs> Hi, um, so my question would be whether you feel like there is a different attitude towards female journalists, especially in the Arab world? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> female in general in the Arab world, they are um, living in a, a hard life than male journalists. In general, being a female is a difficult thing. To live there is a difficult thing because you are looked at as not a fallen human, usually. You are somebody who needs protection, you are not powerful enough, you always need uh, somebody to take care of you who is the male. And uh, not, we have some strong women who broke that uh, stereotype and and they are um, out there by their own, independent, and they do not need male to protect them or to provide food or, or to provide life for them. Uh, being a journalist is a, also another difficult thing to do. So combining these two, I think it's a difficult thing or a difficult choice to take. Uh, being a female and then being a journalist, then you are targeted twice. And the easiest thing is to happen to, to female journalists in, in that, in, in that uh, region is to... Because the honor, which is the body and the sexuality, is, is very um, untouchable and it's a taboo. And just to touch that topic, when it comes to a female journalist, you, then this female journalist could can't continue her life as a journalist or as a female as well in public. If, if any uh, sexual harassment happened or um, let's say, um, uh, how can I say it? Like the, her personal life comes out when it comes to her body and, and her sexuality, it might demolish her career and, and end up her uh, 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 public appearance. Thank you. Hello. 
Uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, what's your personal, uh, for you personally, what's the, uh, the driving force that uh, drives you like uh, to continue being a journalist, even when you are a woman and you come from such an environment, and uh, if it wasn't shocking for you uh, that you um, were running away uh, from the environment you had there, uh, the persecution and the uh, and then, then you came to Europe and like two murders happened in like a half a year, so if this wasn't shocking and, and what's the force that drives you? Thank you. Uh, what it drove me is like when when I when I felt that I am somebody is trying to silence me or the authorities are trying to silence me, I refused that. So that's that's the main purpose why I left and why I continue being a journalist because I, I don't want them to silence me. I'm I'm the voice of people. I'm the voice through me. I can I can say the stories. I can tell the world what's going on in my country. So I I want to continue doing that. I don't want them I don't want them to want that they want to silence me. This is one thing. And the second thing is like, it, for sure it's shocking. It's not only shocking, it's also frustrating and um, it made me mad and angry that I see my colleagues in Europe getting killed and uh, persecuted and harassed. But let's say that at least uh, they are, there's people who cares about them and the media is talking about them and uh, they are, it's a public issue now, and, and I, as I heard yesterday, I heard something that says, we have a crisis since Jan's murder in, in politics, in, in uh, Slovakia. While if this happened in the Arab world, it will just be a small news in the third page, and nobody will talk about it next day. It will be forgotten. At least here, people know what, what, what's the value of journalists and they give him, him or her, they give, they give them the value they, they actually deserve and we fight for justice for them. Are, are, there is, there is a, as, I, as I understood, there is a big uh, a movement now asking for justice for the journalist who was murdered, which is, uh, we all want that. If it happened in the Arab countries, he will be forgotten. He or she will be forgotten, and nobody will talk about it. Even the government will say, um, no, no. maybe he uh, like it's a usual like like um, claim that maybe uh, he got some uh, uh, committed suicide. This is usually the case, and the case will be closed, and nobody will be uh, prosecuted for for what happened. I hope I answered the question. You, okay. Hi, uh, you were talking about the Arab Spring in Bahrain, but mostly when we hear about Arab Spring, we hear about countries like Tunisia or Syria. So I would be really interested in how the situation evolved through, uh, from 2011 until now, and how did the uh, politics evolve through these years. And the second question is, why did you get arrested? Like, the government had obviously like put some reason, reason behind it, and I'm really interested in why, and maybe how you changed uh, after your arrest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you didn't hear about Bahrain, it's because it's very small, and uh, the other movements that happened around it, like Syria, as you said, and maybe Tunis and, and Egypt, it was more bloody. There were more killing, more, uh, and, and in Tunis, for example, the change happened, actually. They changed the, the, the system. The people who went out for, for uh, like, in, in the revolution, they won, and they are now the ones who, is run, who are running the country. They have a democracy. They don't have the same, uh, uh, the previous system. And in Egypt it was the same, they could change the system. But in Bahrain uh, it was one month, one month and a half, and then the, the crackdown happened and nobody will hear about it anymore. 
although the, the demands were continuing for calling for elected government, for a, a, a parliament that's the voice of the people, not just a, a, a cliche, like a, a parliament who, has, who is pro uh, government and pro royal family, and for freedoms, and on the top of them is the freedom of press and freedom of expression. Um, I hope that answer the first uh, question. Why? And there is also many other reasons. I can talk to tomorrow about it. Like when it comes to geopolitics, because uh, Bahrain has a lot of allies when it comes to the royal family. So uh, the, all, most of the Arab uh, countries' uh, uh, governments are allies with the government. So they don't allow their media to cover what's going on in Bahrain. Um, the states. The UK, the French governments are allies with the, with the Bahraini royal family. So also they are, they will be on the side of the royal family and not the pro-democracy movement. That's why very little that it goes to media. If you Google it on, on uh, when it comes to news, you will find some news because, like the French media, the British media, they they publish some stuff about it, but. They can't. They don't do it every day because um, their governments are not really interested in what's going on. Actually, they are interested in what royal family gonna buy um, arms from them or like they gonna sign with them a security agreement, but not what the people are demanding. The next question, I need to remember. <laughs> Like the reason for your arrest? Uh, the reason of my arrest, the, the, the general reason, is because I was covering what, uh, what was going on, the, this movement, in, in the media, and because I work with the French media, so for me, I was taking it out internationally, which made the government uh, uh, angry with, uh, with the, the kind of reports I was doing. Because it was uh, independent and neutral, it was not on one side, which shows a lot of violence and, and violations that the government was doing. But the, the critical story that made them really, really mad is that I saw two protesters were killed in front of me by policemen. It, I saw them with my eyes. And I reported that, and in, in my reports I was saying that I saw them uh, with my eyes, which makes the story much, much more strong. And that what made them really angry, and that's why I got arrested afterwards. And during the interrogation, I was asked about that specific uh, story, and they were telling me why did you what why did you say that you saw the police killing the protesters? And when I answered, I, because I saw them, and because this is my job to pro to report what's what's going on, and they said, yeah, but this is you are trying to do to. Um, like to uh, uh, destroy the image of the country. So they, they don't understand what is, what's our job and how can we, how, how, how do we do our job by seeing things and talking to people and reporting about it, not what the government is telling us to say. So it was, um, uh, the argument was actually not, like, it's not, uh, I can't argue with them because the, the military or like the police uh, mentality uh, doesn't allow them to understand uh, what what journalist what, uh, job is. And the third question, I think, what uh, what affected me, how, how it did affect me after my arrest. Uh, as I said earlier, um, this uh, this arrest has cha changed my life because it gives me another perspective of what's going on inside these police stations. I was reporting about people getting arrested and uh, violated against and uh, mistreated, tortured, but it's different when you being in that situation and, and living that, uh, that experience yourself. It broke a lot inside me. This is the, the aim of, of the torture in general. Like when they torture you, they, the aim is to break something inside you. But I, thanks God, I, I managed to 
to rebuild it and to become strong again and to become uh, out again and to work and to continue my my struggle and also it makes me an advocate for for uh, freedom of press and freedom of expression. I hope I answered your question. So um, I don't know if you if you if you know this, but a few years ago, uh, one of the largest Slovak companies called Penta uh, had bought um, a large, I think, 49 percent of one of our largest media companies, um, and it, and it, it's called Cement. And so, how do you feel about this? Where? Okay, so we are living in a democratic society, but also in a capitalist society, uh, where more pa more money means more power, and these huge companies just want to buy this media to um, generate more revenue for them, and so so it sort of takes the objectivity of the media, and sort of this this media doesn't um, become the voice of facts and the truth, but the voice of of the large companies. Um, and so how do you think it's possible to keep the media truthful and objective in, in this, this kind of society? Thank you. Thank you. A very smart question. Um, I think the system that works in some of the countries that, uh, the, that some of the taxes go to the media, to the independent media that uh, we can't call it even a state media because it's not the voice of the state, but it's run by, like, by the system that's happening in the country. Is the best uh, best example of having an independent, powerful media. I think uh, in in UK and in Germany, as far as I know, uh, and in France, uh, the, the, this system is going on. Like there is a, um, a part of the taxes that people pay is going to the media. And this is a very important, actually, element in the democracy system, because as a citizen, you want to know the facts, independent facts. You don't want it to be the best thing is to pay you kind of like um, percentage of your tax for that purpose, to get the facts, so you can decide to support this government, or to support this party, or not. And to build your, to like, building the, the country and fighting corruption is all, like, the, the press is playing a big role in that. So if we, could, if we couldn't have an independent media that um, bringing facts to us, have we, the, the, democracy, the democracy circle, there would be something wrong with it. And as, as you said, if the cor corporate are affecting what kind of information we are getting as citizens, then uh, we, can, we don't have the large uh, image of what, what actually is going on and affecting our opinions. Maybe uh, people who are uh, re like trying to find the facts themselves would not be affected, but most of the people would be, because this is the, what the media is built for. To, to affect people's uh, public opinion. Yeah, so c calling for that and fighting for that is, uh, is I think it's your next uh, uh, mission, let's say. It's calling for independent media that that's among the system, the democratic system, but not owned by anybody. It's the people's taxes that goes into that system. has recently been proven that Russia somehow meddled with the 2016 election in the US through fake news and fake news websites and hoaxes and stuff that were mostly spread um, on social media. Um, so how, and this obviously 
and uh, you know, democracy and to meddle with elections is, is a very serious thing, it's a very serious issue. Russia is, of course, um, saying that they you know, didn't do anything as always. Uh, so how do you feel we can prevent this from happening? Actually, I answered partially this question last night on your state TV because I was asked, like, how do we uh, deal with the wrong uh, information on social media because it's playing a big role in people's uh, public opinion. And I would say that the social media brought us, uh, like, we thought it's going to be, like, uh, um, good for us and it's a platform that we could express ourselves and to post the news where we, in some countries like mine, we can have independent media, the, the, the social media is a good platform for us, but it's, it has also the negative side of it, which is the false news and the propaganda that even the governments are involved in. Uh, involved in it and they now they know the game so they are investing a lot of money in that to, to make it uh, to make it happen uh, how do we deal with that I think the the mass media the independent media should be on on these platforms as well because we, we can't leave these platforms only for propaganda and for false news the real media, the independent media, should be there as well. And I think most of the media are now having their uh, Twitter accounts and their Facebook pages and their Instagram accounts that they can be visible to more, maybe, your generation because you would love to read the news or see the, the uh, bulletins on, on your mobile phone or on your tablet instead of sitting in front of the TV or reading an actual print newspaper. So the, the, the independent uh, media being on these platforms is somehow trying to uh, give the, the facts, the, the real information through these uh, platforms. Of course, the, 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 the propaganda will be there always, but being there at least, uh, uh, making it make balance and uh, and people who like when they see the, the both news, then they they can think about it. Like, who do I believe, and which is more uh, logical? And of course, the the independent uh, investigative journalism, let's say, they are putting facts in there and putting their sources, so it's more logical for the people to believe what what they are providing. Um, hello. Sorry. Uh, so, since you just mentioned, yes, um, you know, media like Facebook and Twitter have um, a lot of um, power over what people can see nowadays. And, um, it, of course, it's a good thing because, in many ways, these independent journalists can rise and actually have something, um, some, uh, somewhat of an impact. Um, but also, isn't it, don't you think it's kind of dangerous that these corporations have the power to essentially? censor in many ways or, or, or select what can be seen by the people um, like Facebook you know, and Twitter. It is very dangerous, especially now that Facebook are like, accused of uh, a lot of, uh, um, not censorship, but uh, uh, personal information, uh, hacking and, and stuff like that. So we are not uh, secure being on these platforms. But going back to the to the previous questions, is these platforms are already there and we use them. The, my point was being there because uh, people are already using them. Once we stop using them, then maybe I will I will. Uh, be in favor, like I will support that the media stay where they are, stay only on TV and on print, and but because the, these platforms are already there, so being there is it's um, more um, you can reach more people and you can compete with the propaganda that's already out there, and as I said, many governments and many. Um, uh, Authorities now investing 
and, and these platforms to put out fake news and to mobilize people's opinions toward some issues by, by posting uh, uh, wrong news or wrong information that makes people uh, choose other, other way that they should. I don't know if I answered your question. I, I know it's dangerous maybe and it's, it's in the hands of corporate, but it's already there. So now we have probably time for the last question. I, you want to go to, to lunch, right? I wanted to ask about the recent crisis between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. So one of the points they were demanding was to stop uh, broadcasting of Al Jazeera. And I wanted to ask if you what is your stance on it, if you believe that Al Jazeera is providing some objective information. And secondly, if um, so, the more in, in the Western world, the, probably how we divide the newspaper is our own more conservative and more liberal ones, or more left-leaning and right-leaning ones. And if you would say that in the Arab world it is more divided on religion, so it is more like the Shia-leaning one versus the uh, Sunni-leaning ones. Thank you. About the Jazeera, I don't, I don't think myself, personally, that the Jazeera is an independent or a trustworthy um, channel, but I'm against the calling to uh, stop it or shutting it down. It's it's. Uh, uh, I I call for it to be independent more, and for it to be more uh, fact-based uh, channel, but not to shut it down. I'm against shutting down any media and shutting some voice, like a voice of anybody. This is one. And the second is, I don't think it's divided uh, uh, really uh, when it comes uh, to the media upon religion. It's divided more in the Arab world when it comes to loyalists, pro-government, and opposition. And there is these in between who are neutral, independent, but they are rare in the Arab world. Like I can't say there is almost none. Yeah. So um, in, in Europe, I think it's it's the outcome of the democracy because what's what's uh, the system is uh, what, the system that's been happening here is there is an opposition and there is. Um, governments and parties that's uh, trying to be in governments or trying like they are playing the normal role of politically if if you have uh, uh, supporters enough supporters then you can be in the government or you can be more in the parliament and you can have more voice on what uh, what laws you are um, passing and what kind of system you want to have in the country and for example, how to deal with the refugees, for example. But in, in our region, because there is no real system of democracy, so there is only those who are saying, oh, all what the government is doing is perfect, and it's amazing, and uh, this minister is saying that, and the prime minister is saying that, without the other side of the opposition who are criticizing, for example, or calling for more uh, development or for more uh, democracy or for more freedom. Thank you, Nazira. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm amazed actually with the, the level of questions. It's, you have a very smart student. Thank you once again for being with us and answering our questions. Uh, we are always happy if we can have this kind of
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I would be you happy now. to see you to, tonight if anybody wants to join the event in the fusion festival. Thank you.